Pete Buttigieg has always claimed that he's not bad and that he doesn't stink. But recent revelations from literally his entire career that have always been publicly available show otherwise. In 2012, Buttigieg removed Black Police Chief Daryl Boykins for investigating his white senior officer's discriminatory racial attitudes, demoting him from his position. Documents reveal that Buttigieg did this at the request of a high-dollar campaign donor. Buttigieg, whiter than a polar bear in a snowstorm, took the side of the white officers and replaced Boykins with not one, but two white guys. The black community called for Buttigieg to be impeached, but his white behind wasn't going anywhere. Buttigieg claims to have turned his city around, but really only for white people. A South Bend City Commission study from 2017 found the black population has higher levels of poverty and unemployment than the country. About 40% of black residents are living below the poverty line, and there is an 11% unemployment rate in that community. Buttigieg funnels money into neighborhoods and projects that don't need it, instead of neighborhoods and communities that do. To combat the perception that he doesn't care about black people, Buttigieg released his Douglas Plan to reform the justice system, but there was a problem because of course there was because he's Pete Buttigieg. He said that 400 South Carolinians endorsed his plan and said they were all black supporters, but it turns out many of the names listed as endorsements were neither black nor even his supporters. The list of phony endorsements even included the co-chair of the state's Bernie Sanders campaign. Pete Buttigieg's support among black people is so non-existent that he invents black people who like him. Don't vote for Mayo Pete in the primaries. He lies all the time and he's a big smelly loser. Eat Pete Buttigieg. Pay for by the committee to tell Pete Buttigieg to eat Okay, so everything Pete Buttigieg does is deceptive and dishonest. I'm not going to be naive and give a charitable interpretation of Buttigieg's words and deeds. Everything about his behavior, from running away from reporters who ask him hard questions, to smiling while dismissing teenagers, to reliable accounts of him telling colleagues that he will say anything to win, gives the impression of a deeply dishonest politician who isn't even as good at hiding his dishonesty as other dishonest politicians. Look, all politicians lie. Everyone knows that. But there are degrees. Mathematically, Donald Trump lies more than the average politician. A lot more. And although there is less data on Buttigieg, I argue that he does too. You know he's about to tell a real whopper when he makes that controlled rage rat face? Here are some of the most obvious examples and the key reasons why nobody should be supporting this sentient piece of Wonder Bread. Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All program amounts to having the super-rich pay more taxes so that the entire country can be on the Medicare plan. It will happen incrementally over the course of just a few years until everyone is on it. Pete Buttigieg's health care plan is to have a public option in which some people will opt in and some people will opt out. Buttigieg's claims that this is about freedom, but a closer look at what he's proposing suggests that he's a liar who lies a lot. The problem with Buttigieg's plan is that it's only a partial plan and not a universal plan. A partial plan is very difficult to maintain due to Republican obstruction. Universal programs essentially cause less resentment among the population than partial programs. Partial programs with means testing has conservatives up in arms claiming that people with jobs are paying for the unemployed. These programs to help unemployed and underemployed should exist, but it should be acknowledged that they cause some resentment among some voters. And this incentivizes Republican politicians to rally against the programs to shore up votes. Universal programs that cover everyone, however, cause less resentment. We're all part of the program. There is nobody rallying against them because we would all suffer if we lost the program. For example, the fire department is a public institution that we pay for with taxes. We are all meant to be protected from fires by the fire department. It's universal, not partial. And since the fire department puts out fires for the rich and poor alike, nobody wants to get rid of it. The rich don't rally Republicans to remove the fire department. Republicans cannot convince their voters that having no more fire departments in the United States is a good idea. The poor and middle class do not rally Democrats to remove the fire department either. No Republican or Democratic politician is calling for the end of all fire departments because everybody is covered and nobody wants it to go away. 
It's a universal program, and since everyone benefits from it relatively equally, it's universally popular and causes little resentment regardless of class. A partial program causes resentment and can therefore be removed with a lot of support by Republican voters. A partial plan is very difficult to maintain due to Republican obstruction. If there is no real commitment to this public option, Republicans can work to dismantle it as they did with the health care reform under the previous president. They are safe to take it apart at the behest of the private insurance industry. Then, after Republicans dismantle and defund the public option, they will do what they always do, claim it was never a good idea in the first place. That's what the Republican Party does. They get into government, defund programs that serve the public good, and then claim that said programs don't work while obfuscating that it was they who defunded them in the first place. It's a con on the level of a carnival ring toss, but everyone just keeps lining up for it. Under actual Medicare for All, as proposed by Bernie Sanders, Republicans would not be safe to defund it because virtually everyone would be covered under the plan, and the private insurance industry would have less and less power over time and therefore less influence and ability to, let's say, persuade politicians to do their bidding. In short, when you take the private insurance industry out of the equation and make sure that health care is universal, Medicare for All can function better than what we have now and be very difficult to be removed even by a Republican Congress. Conversely, when you add a public option but retain the private insurance industry, like Buttigieg proposes, all it accomplishes is having a public option for a little while and then defunded by Republicans and smeared by a still thriving private insurance industry. It happened with the ACA, and it will happen again under Buttigieg. Republicans made the ACA less effective, and not enough people cared because not everyone was on it. Democrats want something better than what Buttigieg is describing, and Republicans want something even worse than what we have now. It's an unpopular proposal that will go nowhere. People act as if Sanders' plan will go nowhere, even if the Democrats take the Senate back. But Sanders' plan actually has a better shot because, one, there is more support for it among voters, and two, President Sanders would actually try to get it passed. The idea of a Medicare for all... The idea that the United States of America should join every other major country on earth in guaranteeing health care to every man, woman, and child, this is not a radical idea. In fact, poll after poll shows that a majority of the American people support that idea. People want to know why, as a nation, George, we are spending twice as much per capita on health care as do the people of Canada or many of the European countries, while our health care outcomes are not necessarily as good. And people also want to know why we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. So I don't see this as a radical idea. I see it as an idea that more and more people want. Medicare today is a very popular program. It's the most popular health insurance program in the country. Let's expand it to everybody over a four-year period. Actual Medicare for All is more popular, so enough Democrats will try to get it through. It might not pass, but it has a better shot with a president who will actually strongly advocate for it. Buttigieg's plan is a compromise, and one that he doesn't even believe in. He's not making it a central issue of his campaign, he's running away from it. Whenever he's asked a hard question, he ducks out or gets defensive. We know Mayor Pete Buttigieg was in town because he tweeted this photo of himself flying to Houston from D.C. last night. Look, his seat on the plane right behind Senator Amy Klobuchar, but he went to a noontime fundraiser in the Rice Military Area at the Hiram Butler Art Gallery. He didn't say a whole lot. In fact, didn't say anything on the way in. All we got was a glimpse of that Suburban. On the way out, though, my colleague Maya Shea, she tried to talk to him. Take a look. She posted it to her Instagram. She was sort of bum-rushed by a campaign aide for Mayor Pete who said, we're not talking. And then Pete smiled and got in his Suburban and took off. Do you really think that if elected, he will stump for it and put his heart and soul into a plan that he is actively avoiding talking about? And even if it passes, Buttigieg will not defend it because his plan is clearly designed to be friendly to private insurance companies. He wants their support. He will happily let it die. If you leave Republicans the ability to dismantle something, they will. If you leave too much wiggle room in your plan, Republicans will exploit it. Buttigieg's plan is for something that can't last, and that's the point. Moving on, let's talk about free public college. So Buttigieg is lying to you, sorry. Bernie Sanders' free public college plan is exactly that, free public college. P. 
Pete Buttigieg says his plan is free public college, but with a catch. His plan would have means testing that judges whether or not you are poor enough to receive free public college. He's campaigning with this plan as if he doesn't want to let the super rich get free public college, but that's not actually what means testing free public college would do. And he's smart enough to know that. He's lying. Like he does. First of all, Buttigieg's line about poor people paying for rich people to go to public college is garbage. The taxes that will pay for free public college are coming predominantly from rich people. It's actually rich people who will be paying for poor people to go to free public college, not the other way around. In absolutely no substantive way are poor people paying for rich people because of the manner in which this would potentially be funded. Second, how many millionaires are sending their children to public colleges? They're sending them to Harvard and other private universities because they can afford to. Even if they weren't, it doesn't change the fact that the rich will be paying into this system significantly more than poor people ever will. As for means testing, it's trash, and I'll tell you why. Not making the system universal and absolute will allow lawmakers to exploit it. They will create loopholes and stricter means tests to keep out a lot more people, not just the rich. Also, mistakes will undoubtedly be made, and some poor people will undoubtedly be left out due to these mistakes. If the system is universal, there is no way to keep someone out even if there's a mistake. Also, even if the system could somehow operate perfectly, what happens when a student going to free public college for the first year is suddenly taken out of the system if their parents get bumped up to a higher tax bracket, or the qualifications change between years? Who is tested? the student or the parents. If it's the parents, what if the parents are millionaires but have their kid cut off? Parents disown their children sometimes, usually for the worst reasons. If it's the student's income that's tested, they are always going to be poor, so the system is redundant and only exists to potentially make those aforementioned mistakes. Furthermore, Sanders' free public college plan covers trade schools, but Buttigieg's plan does not a lot of people are going to be left out. Pete Buttigieg wants this system because he knows it won't work well, won't cover as many people, and won't cost the super rich as much. He's trying to protect the super rich from paying for poor people's public college. The rich are donating to his campaign, and that's who he's looking out for. It's the same as his phony healthcare plan. He doesn't really want it to work, or he knows it's flawed but likes the flaws. He's no fool, so he must know about the flaws, which only leaves the first option. He doesn't really want it. Here's why I suspect that. Pete Buttigieg basically takes Sanders' most popular ideas because he wants to be popular too. Then he twists them to sound more reasonable to his moderate voters, even though what he's really doing is making them untenable. Okay, there is so much more. Let's talk about Mayor Pete as mayor. With 14% of South Bend's housing vacated or abandoned, Buttigieg had a task force identify every property and recommend an overall course of action. His conclusion was that the city should fine homeowners and empower officials to demolish properties at the owner's expense. Okay, but here's the thing. See, most of the homes were in low-income black and Latino neighborhoods, where some city residents had housing from deceased relatives or were still listed as owners despite having been forced out by expensive mortgages. Both the fines and demolitions tended to be heavily concentrated in these neighborhoods. South Bend's eviction rate doubled between 2012, when Buttigieg was first elected, and 2016, Buttigieg presides over an eviction rate that is three times the national average. Buttigieg does not care about poor people. But the rich? Oh, he gives them subsidies for luxury apartments. That's who he cares about. The poor can be evicted and made to be homeless, and the rich are supported by the South Bend government. According to the South Bend Tribune, as all of this was happening, the homeless became subject to arrest, and placement of Do Not Give to Panhandlers signs were put on street corners. The space underneath South Bend's Main Street, which had previously been used as a shelter for the homeless, became subject to surveillance thanks to newly installed cameras that Buttigieg wanted put up. He's spying on the homeless. 
Buttigieg runs South Bend like a business, which is not surprising due to his work prior to being mayor. He worked for global consulting firm McKinsey. McKinsey is most infamously known for their work with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. What Buttigieg did there is largely unknown, but journalists have uncovered bits and pieces. Buttigieg did consulting for a project with Blue Cross Blue Shield, where he was involved in decisions that led to mass layoffs, increased premiums, and many people losing their health insurance. Buttigieg was part of a team of consultants that had the United States Postal Service cut back operation times, automate postal services, and replace unionized labor with non-union labor. Pete Buttigieg is no friend to the workers or to the unions. He also worked on a McKinsey contract in the Middle East, exploring how to best extract and exploit their natural resources, an environmentally destructive project that has also been widely criticized as a huge waste of U.S. taxpayer dollars. So what else was he up to at McKinsey? Well, he claims that he has been trying to get out of his non-disclosure agreement so that he can be more forthcoming with the press. But that doesn't sound like Pete Buttigieg, who is infamous for not being forthcoming with the press. Here's Mayor Pete taking questions about his closed-door meetings with big-money corporate donors and refusing to disclose information about them to the press. Mayor, earlier today you said you were open to having a conversation about opening your fundraisers, and that's a question that reporters have been asking for months now, so I'm wondering when do you expect to to actually have that conversation and give an answer on that? Uh, Again, I don't have a timeline for you. Well, as, the, as the candidate, can't you just direct your campaign to open those What's that? As the candidate, can't you just direct your campaign to open those Yes. And why haven't you done so? What's that? Why haven't you done so? Uh, there are a lot of considerations, and I'm thinking about it. Last question. Can you give us an example of those considerations? No. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, Thanks. Thank you. We do know some things about Buttigieg's smaller donors, mostly that he has the highest amount of donor dollars from those working in the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security. So if you're wondering if he's a cop, well, he's a cop. Buttigieg's big money donors, however, are his bread and butter. Both Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have sworn off high dollar fundraisers, but Buttigieg will do anything to win, even sell himself to the highest bidder. Billionaires should not pick the next president of the United States. Billionaires aren't holding secret fundraisers in wine caves with Buttigieg because they like his swagger and they just felt like inviting him to a party. They're buying access because they want something in return. These aren't small-time donors who donate $1 because they think it's the right thing to do. These are billionaires who want a piece of the government. I am... Rather proud, maybe, I don't know, the only candidate up here doesn't have any billionaire contributions. But you know what I do have? We have received more contributions from more individuals than any candidate in the history of the United States of America at this point in an election, averaging $18 apiece. Now, there's a real competition going on up here. My good friend Joe, and he is a good friend, (laughs) He's received contributions from 44 billionaires. Pete, on the other hand, is trailing, Pete. You only got 39 billionaires contributing. So, Pete, we look forward to you. I know you're an energetic guy and a competitive guy to see if you can take on Joe on that issue. But what is not... What is not a laughing matter, my friends, this is why three people own more wealth than the bottom half. This is why Amazon and other major corporations pay zero in federal taxes. We need to get money out of politics. We should run our campaigns on that basis. Based on the incident with the South Bend police chief, we know what Pete Buttigieg will do once he's bought. Buttigieg first fired the police chief at the behest of one of his donors, then eased off and demoted him instead when he realized he was going to get caught. And that only happened in a small town. Imagine that level of access to the highest office in the land. Elections are won on turnout, and turnout requires an excited and motivated electorate. That means exciting and motivating candidates. Democrats aren't motivated by boring candidates and candidates that are out of step with progress. 
Hopefully, Buttigieg will drop out early in the primaries, and nobody will ever consider him for Veep. On January 1st, 2020, James Muller will be inaugurated as the new mayor of South Bend. I truly hope that 2020 is the last we ever hear of Pete Buttigieg. Uh, a good example of this is something like slavery or civil rights. Uh, for uh, It's a, an embarrassing thing to admit, but the people who wrote the Constitution did not understand that slavery was a bad thing and did not respect civil rights. Uh, and yet they created a framework uh, so that as the generations came to understand that that was important, they could write that into the Constitution too.